ears, but Buddy is not a very good listener at all. In fact, Buddy is constantly messing up the instructions given to him by his parents. For example, once his parents ask him for a pen, and Buddy goes and brings them a head, a chicken, a head. Another time, his parents ask Buddy to get a basket of I won't mention names. <clears throat> and at the end, he's almost eaten by this, by this big, dirty bear, the scruffy varmint. Well, by the end of this short uh, story, but he learns the importance of knowing how to listen, how to effectively listen to his parents. <clears throat> Have we learned to effectively listen to God? Have we? No. God has given us his word in print. He's given us his word preached from the pulpit. It's taught corporately in Bible studies many of you are a part of. And many people, hopefully most of us in here, if not all, hopefully we all study it on our own. The word of God. God's also given us the Holy Spirit who illuminates our understanding of his word. But do we listen effectively? Do we listen? Now, again, it's important to remember some of the background of James as we've seen it through the last number of weeks. If you remember, James is full of these tests, tests of true conversion, or sometimes we say, uh, this is what a Christian should look like. This is how a Christian should act. There's a lot of this in James. James talks a lot about the place of works in the Christian life. Now, he doesn't teach that salvation comes through works, but rather, as we've seen, he teaches that true salvation should bear some fruit. We should be able to see fruit of our salvation, that salvation, that indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the, the, the regeneration should overflow into good works. Now, our two verses here today come from a section that is oftentimes called the test of response to the word. Okay? And that's, the whole section is chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. Why is that important? Why is that important? Well, it's important if we're going to properly apply these instructions in verses 19 and 20, isn't it? Let's read it again. 19 and 20. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Now when we read this text by itself, without the rest of the verses after it, we probably overgeneralize it. Right? We probably read this and we say, okay, I get this. It means we should be quick to listen to people. We should be slow to open our mouths at times. We should be slow to anger, right? Well, is all of that true? Is all of that true? True. Are those things true? Yes. Well, our response to others or our response to God's word. Douglas Moo believes it refers to our relationships with each other. John MacArthur believes it refers to our, our response to the Word of God. Lee Thomas thinks it refers to relationships with one another and with God. I agree with Lee Thomas on this. A quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That is general wisdom known by James' primary, primarily Jewish audience. It should be known to us. So yes, we are supposed to react this way with each other. Absolutely we are. But more specifically, the context is a Christian's response to the Word of God, and this general proverbial wisdom is James's launching pad from how we react to one another to how we react with him and his Word. It's as if he's saying this, okay? As you all know, Right? This is general wisdom we're all taught. As you all know, you should be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger with each other in life, with your parents, with your kids, but also with God and with His Word. 
How does that change our understanding of this, of these verses? How does it change our understanding? Well, follow the progression with me, if you will, in James. Chapter 1, verses 2 through 12, we talked about joyfully withstanding the storms. Not just withstanding the storms, withstanding them joyfully. And then, chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, we saw that we can get derailed in our walk with Christ. We get derailed in these times of trial. We saw that we can be tempted to doubt God. We can be tempted to sin. And this temptation cannot be blamed on God. We can't blame God for that. We cannot blame other people for our temptation. We saw that it starts where? In the inside of us. It's a heart issue. And that temptation, we saw, births destruction. And then in today's passage, are you quick to hear? Are you slow to speak and slow to get angry? Are you quick to listen during these trials? Or are you quick to get angry during struggles in life? Are you quick to hear the word of God speaking to you through these trials? Or not? Well, that's where James goes after this. Now here he says, he talks about hearing the word, then receiving the word, and then, you got it, doing the word. Because we are supposed to be doers of the word, not just hearers only. True? Amen. True? So the main point here is how to effectively hear the word. The surrounding context is about the word. Verse 18, he brought us forth, or birthed us, by the word of God. Verses 22 and 23, you are to prove that you are doers of the word, not just hearers. Also in verse 25, it talks about doing the law, not just hearing it. They're supposed to be doers, not just hearers. We are to be both hearers and doers of the word, and today is about effectively hearing that word. It's the first part, because you can't do if you don't first hear. So today, here are three guidelines to effectively hear the word of God. Uh, as we go through this, I want you also to apply this with your personal relationships, so keep both of those in tandem, okay? How to effectively hear but also how to effectively hear the Word of God. To effectively hear the Word of God, be quick to hear. That's what the verse says, be quick to hear the Word. To effectively hear the Word of God, be slow to speak. You probably know what the third one is. To effectively hear the Word of God, be slow to anger. So the first one, to effectively hear the Word of God, be quick to hear the Word. What does that even mean? What does it mean to be quick to hear the word? By the way, if you look at the Greek, guess what it means? Quick. <laughs> it means quick, rapid, swift, fast. That's what it means. Nothing earth shattering than that. So what does it mean for us to be quick to hear the word? Well, uh, we talked about it in Sunday school today. Even sometimes it's great to look at the opposite. So what's the opposite of quick? Slow. Slow. Sluggish. I like the word apathetic. Oh, yeah. Apathetic. How many professing Christians do you know who are apathetic about the word? Are you apathetic about the word? Apathy. Most of us have email accounts, right? Most of us. How much of the spam or junk mail that shows up, or even if you go up to your mailbox and you end up with a pile of advertisements and that sort of thing, how many of that, how many of those letters, those advertisements, do you actually spend time reading through? All of it? Zero. Zero? I heard a zero. Not much, right? For most of us, junk mail is unimportant, Beyond that, it's bothersome. Mm -hmm. It's bothersome. And we don't spend that much time reading through our junk mail or through our spam and junk mail and our email accounts either. But what if, here's a scenario, Jeffrey the Mailman, that's actually his name, Jeffrey the Mailman, shows up at your door and he's holding this letter and it requires a signature. You're like, wow, who is this from? 
And you notice that the letters from, you can fill in the blank, but Vice President Mike Pence. A letter from Vice President Mike Pence. Would you read that letter? No. <laughs> One person would not. Gary. Yeah, Gary. <laughs> I think most of us would read a letter that we have to sign even if it was from someone less significant than he. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's from the, I don't know, fill in the blank. Someone important, lesser than even the Vice President of the United States, we would probably open that letter, we would probably read it, and we probably would not treat it like junk mail. Well, the creator of the universe the best thing in, the creator of the universe has sent a few letters to you. Wow. These are love letters to you. These are letters of encouragement to you. Letters of encouragement in times of, uh, in wonderful times, and letters of encouragement in times of trial to you. They are letters telling you how to get about your life as a believer in Christ. They're instructions written to you. Don't be apathetic. Don't be lazy about these letters to you. Be quick to hear the word. And doesn't that carry a sense of urgency? Be quick. It's urgent. Be quick. This is no normal book. You know that. Yeah. It's the most important book ever written. We can't be apathetic. Christians should respond to the Word of God, right? One, they should respond, and that response should be very positive, urgent, and we should be eager to know about God's Word more and more. And the longer we're a believer, the more we should want to know what's in there. Secondly, to effectively hear the Word of God, be slow to speak. All right, now there's a few ways we can apply this, isn't there? In everyday life with one another, I, I mentioned we need to keep that kind of in our minds as we look through this, but also we need to do so in hearing the Word of God. How do we do this? What are some ways that we apply this? Okay, now this is going to blow your mind, all right? Are you ready? One way to apply this idea of being slow to speak is to simply stop talking. <laughs> Be slow to speak. Listen, in American culture, we talk far more than we listen. Mm -hmm. We do. We are the experts. We will save the day. We are the teachers. But we forget to be students. Right? And we forget to listen to one another. And even more importantly here, we start to talk over God's word without hearing what he is saying to us personally. We are the experts. We open our mouths without listening to what God is whispering to our hearts individually. We cannot do that. Last week I mentioned some of the sin that James tells us about later in the letter, if you remember. I mentioned things like partiality, a tongue that burns things down, civil war in the church, war with God, slander, selfish game, straying away. How many of you elbowed your spouse last week? Anybody? Be honest, come on. How many of you thought, I sure hope that person across the aisle is listening to this sermon? Understand that last week and today is for you, each of you. You see, we're quick to speak, we are slow to listen, we are, we are quick to justify our own sin, aren't we? We open our mouths without first listening to what God is whispering to us. Have you ever been part of a conversation that never goes anywhere? Mm -hmm. Now that's probably 100% of us. Lots of talking, very little listening. This even happens in Bible studies, doesn't it? I've been a part of Bible studies before where the Bible study becomes a bunch of shared ignorance, right? We... <laughs> But that's in A bunch of shared events. 
We all share our opinions, right? Now understand, I value every single one of your opinions. I do. But what I value even more than your opinion is God's opinion. Amen. And that's who we need to be listening to. Remember Diotrephes in 3 John? What was, what was he being reprimanded for? Well, Diotrephes always had to be at the center of attention. Uh, 3 John 9. He had to have things his way. He was speaking wicked nonsense. 3 John 10. Diotrephes was what? Slow to listen, quick to speak, quick to anger. We don't want to be him. We do not want to be Diotrephes. Another way to apply this idea of being slow to speak is talked more about in chapter 3, we're back in James, James 3, 1. And this is interesting, okay? This comes up a little bit later in our, in our epistle here. And interestingly, it mentions that not everyone should be a teacher. That's interesting, isn't it? And most scholars believe that this is the thrust of the words here in our two passages. Just a little bit later, in James 3, 1, it says this, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. Well, that's interesting. So we should be careful about becoming teachers. Why would that be? Why? Are there any Spider-Man fans here? <laughs> okay. You might remember. Yeah, probably not too many of you, right? You might remember Uncle Ben's famous line to Peter Parker, with great power comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a, here's a slightly more biblical note on that. Luke 12, 48. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. Teaching the truths of God is a big responsibility. It's a big responsibility and we cannot take that lightly. So we need to look at that and the connection between our verse and chapter 3, verse 1. And to go even further with that thought is that some people should stop being a teacher. Now that even sounds more bizarre to me, doesn't it to you? What, what does this mean? So this is also from James 3, 1, but it's more of a grammatical, translational issue. This sentence, when it's structured, can be translated two different ways. One is that not all of you should be teachers. The other way is some of you should stop being teachers. Well, now, wait a minute. I thought Christians were commanded to be teachers. All of us. Now, I personally want every single person in here to aspire to being a great teacher of the gospel, the truths of God. I want you to open your mouths and pass those on to others. If you've known me for any length of time, you've heard me say that. We said that in Sunday school today. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. We're all familiar with that. The Great Commission. Go make disciples and what? Teach them. And shouldn't we all be teachers? Shouldn't we all be teaching others about Christ and the gospel? Shouldn't we all be able to explain that we can't earn our way to heaven? Shouldn't we? We cannot earn our way to heaven, but we must place our faith in Christ alone who did it for us. It's a free gift to us that we must respond to in faith. Amen. Shouldn't everyone have the skill to pass that on to their unsaved brother, their unsaved sister, parents, friends? So what's going on here in James 3.1? And what's the connection to being slow to speak here in chapter 1, verse 19? Let's talk about this for a second. A couple of things to mention on this. Let me just start by saying we need godly wisdom concerning when and how to teach. Ecclesiastes 3.7, there is a time to be silent and a time to speak. Right? Yes, there is definitely a time to teach. There's definitely a time for sharing of the gospel message. But there's also a time to listen to God and effectively hear God speaking to you. There's a time for that. 1 Corinthians 10.23 says that all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things are edifying, or not all things edify. Listen, sometimes 
when we open our mouths, it is honestly not edifying. It's not profitable, is it? Sometimes the most profitable thing is to listen and to hear the word of God, the word he is speaking to us at that moment. Sometimes we have to shut our mouth and listen to God. Amen. And there's something very important to note here. Something else important in James 3.1. It says not everyone should be a teacher. And this is important for all of us. This is talking about people in some official teaching capacity. Okay, This is not saying that you should never teach the gospel to your neighbors. This was an official teaching capacity level. Uh, official teachers are in the position of, a, of spiritual authority. Remember, prophets were the representatives of God to man. Prophets were the representative of God to man. Thus saith the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. That's the prophet. Priests were representatives of man to God. They offered up sacrifices for sin and so on. What about the preacher? What is a preacher's job? The preacher's job is to take God's prophetic word to the people. The preacher's job is to understand God's message, to open it up, look at it, study it, understand it, and then take it to the people. Pass that message on to the people. And not everyone is called to these official teaching positions, but all of us should be sharing our faith. Here's a, here's a good way to look at it. In court cases, there are witnesses and there are expert witnesses. A witness simply tells what they saw. Hey, all I know is I saw that, that car run into that car. That's all I know. Or is in John 9, 25, he then answered, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, I now see. I don't know the whole story. I just know that I was blind, now I see. I saw that car hit that car. That's a witness. Mm -hmm. The witness tells their personal account of a certain situation, a witness. The expert witness is in the court to give their expert testimony. Yes, I am a medical doctor. And I conclude that this person sustained these injuries due to this car accident. That is my expert opinion after looking at all the circumstances. That's an expert witness. Each of us is a witness for Christ. Each of us has a voice. Each of us, if, if we understand that we are saved through Christ's blood, we cannot earn our way, but it's through faith in Him, we need to pass that on to others, right? We don't begin as expert witnesses who know everything when we first become a Christian, do we? I wish we did. It takes growth, right? And all of us are students of the Word. I hope everyone in here considers themselves a student of the Word. Sometimes we need to be slow to speak, quick to listen. And not everyone is called to be a pastor, preacher, teacher, elder, whatever. Fill in the blank. And we see that here in James. There is a diversity of function within the church. That is so wonderful. Mm -hmm. That is such a blessing. God did it that way for a reason. And if everyone in here was like me, whoa. <laughs> Lord help us. Hey, if everyone in here was like you, same thing, okay? Amen. <laughs> So, there's a time for all of us to shut our mouths and to listen. There's a time for that. Not everyone should be in this official capacity of being a teacher, and there's a time for teachers, for some teachers, to stop. This is uh, some advice from a pastor on whether or on when a teacher should actually stop being a teacher. This is kind of funny, but uh, to me, it's interesting reading through this. So, uh, it says... If one does not respect the inspiration and authority of the Bible, he should quit teaching. Doesn't that seem like common sense? Mm -hmm. It does to me. If one does not respect the inspiration and authority of the Bible, he should quit teaching. He has no business corrupting the mind of a student. 
if one desires a teaching position only for the honor of that role, it is not genuinely dedicated to his students, he should stop teaching. If a teacher is lazy and does not really spend time in preparation, he is a disservice to the cause of Christ. And lastly, if a teacher has no real enthusiasm for the word, he should abandon the role. It is a teaching crime of great magnitude when one conveys the impression that the sacred scriptures are boring. Hmm. Yeah. Wow, tell us what you really think. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, to say it again, there is a time to teach, there is a time to listen, and there is a time to hear God's word to you. Then lastly here, to effectively hear the word of God, be slow to anger. Generally speaking, Right? Generally speaking, Christians should be slow to anger in everyday life. <clears throat> anger plugs up our ears, doesn't it? Yeah. We stop listening. Have you ever had a sinus infection? Yeah. Yeah. And your ears are plugged and you can't hear anything? Yeah. Here, here's some of the uh, common uh, opinions on how to deal with a sinus infection, okay? When you came here today, you probably didn't expect information on sinus infections. <laughs> now this is, by the way, I have to mention that this is not medical uh, advice. I'm not allowed to give medical advice. This is just people's opinions, okay? Take a hot shower, a hot steamy shower. Some say make a mixture of hydrogen peroxide and warm water and pour it into your ears. Never tried that one. Pinch your nose and blow to pop your ears so that it will drain. That, now that, that, that sounds painful. Drop warm olive oil into your ears. Combine rubbing alcohol with apple cider vinegar as ear drops and to help treat the infection. People keep telling me that apple cider vinegar fixes everything. <laughs> Apply a warm compress to the ears. Gargle with warm water and salt. And of course, there's lots of other things we've all tried. <laughs> Um, including up and up to and including antibiotics and so on. We have all done similar things to unplug our ears to remove some form of sinus infection. But by definition, to be infection free means that the infection is gone. It is no longer there. Somehow that infection is removed, right? Likewise, if you're going to be open to someone's words or be open to God's word speaking to your heart, you must remove that plug out of your ear, that anger, as it says in our text here in James. What about here within the context of the word of God? Well, it's interesting to look at this word translated uh, from the Greek. Uh, it's not simply a, an explosive outburst of anger. Its, it's meaning is more of a deep-seated anger. This is a deep internal feeling of resentment, of rejection. You might say accompanied by bitterness. This is a little bit more than someone losing their temper. This is deep-seated, long-standing. This is an infection. This is something that's been ongoing. This, this is that temptation that we heard about in previous weeks. This is that temptation that starts to fester in our hearts. And then we try to blame it on external issues. That is the tempter. No, the temptation comes from within. That's what this is talking about. When anger is present, listening disappears. When anger is present, it's hard to hear the word of God speaking to our hearts. And believe it or not, there's something even worse than those things. Sometimes we become very good at using scripture to justify our sin. 